to tonight's webinar. This is a continuation from an autumn series of webinars that we, we did. Um, and tonight, I suppose, we're looking at the horticultural side of organics. Uh, I suppose we get a lot of queries, uh, a lot through the 25-hour course. We've an awful lot of interest in people looking at starting a horticultural business or also people who are in an existing horticultural business that want to scale it up. So I suppose that's who we're trying to target tonight's uh, webinar at. So with that in mind, we have three great speakers for you. So we have Owen Sweetman, who is a Ch Chagas Horticultural Advisor. And Owen is going to start at the basic principles of growing the veg um, and where to start from. Then we have Padraig Fahey of Beach Lawn Organics. And Padraig has established a business and taken it from probably started at a small scale to quite a substantial scale now. And is one of the most successful organic horticulture growers in the country. And Padraig is just going to tell us his story, how he got to where he is. And third up then, but not least, is Gillian Westbrook from the Irish Organic Association and Gillian and the IOA took the lead role on an EIP project called the MOPS project, which was maximizing uh, organic production systems. And uh, she's going to, it was a huge success, and she's going to outline the, the, the basis of that project and the outcomes and the learnings from it. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I suppose before we start, I just tell you, if you have questions, there's, they're going in there to the Q&A, and that's great to see. So keep firing questions into the Q&A. And we'll answer all the questions at the end. Uh, we'll probably just go through the, the three speakers um, straight off, and then we'll we'll take all the questions in one go at the end. Um, so keep keep them coming. So uh, Owen, if you would like to share your screen there and uh, kick the thing off. Thanks, Joe. Is that uh, clear on the screen there now, Joe? Yeah, perfect, Owen. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Joe and Elaine, for inviting me to speak here this evening. Um, I am a vegetable advisor in the Horticultural Development Department, and I'm going to speak about the principles of organic vegetable growing. Um, this talk is, I suppose, aimed at, um, at those of you out there that are maybe not growing at the moment, but interested in getting into growing. So it'll just be a quick run through some of the basic where to get started. That, that's some of the questions you might have. Um, so straight away, location, site requirements, uh, you want somewhere that's accessible, close to your market and population. Really, the first thing you should be thinking about is who your market's going to be um, and where they are. Um, in terms of the site, it should be south facing if possible to catch as much sun. It should be open but not exposed site. So something that has, uh, you know, you can get um, air movement around, no frost pockets, but then not too windy that you're going to have damage from wind um, and the weather. Um, soil suitable for organic vegetable growing. So really most soil, most soil types um, are suitable for organic vegetable growing, providing they are well drained. Um, and soil is made up of sand, silt and clay. Um, sand being the largest particles, silt being the medium particles and clay are the small particles. So sand soils will be beneficial because they'll allow you to have earlier production. They'll warm up faster. And um, then clay soils will be heavier and will be colder so you'll have slightly later production but then they're less prone to drought because they, they hold on to more water and um, you need a good soil structure something that's not too compact and um, soil is made up of about 40 to 60 percent pores made up um, usually of, well, of, of air and um, on water so these are important for the roots to have somewhere to, to get down into if you can't get the roots down into the soil you won't have good crops and um, so the first thing you should do really when identifying a site um, and before really is take soil samples and um, you need to know your ph your p's k's potassium and phosphorus and micronutrients and uh, an organic matter and um, any soil lab can tell you this um, and the chocolate soil labs do this as well so they'll give you your soil nutrients in an index form um, one being low four being very high and if you want to be somewhere in around three um, that's what kind of where you're aiming for so again, just further on soil, um, your, your main aim really, and one of the main principles of, of uh, organic production is building soil fertility using green manures, compost, farmyard manures. And it's very important to know where these manures are coming from and um, that they are you know, suitable for organic production, that they haven't had chemicals sprayed on them and, and then you're using them in organic. So you can't do that. You need to know where your, your manures and compost are coming from. Um, one of the first things you need to do as well, remove weeds, don't allow weeds to go to seed, you'll have, have a, a 
major problems down the line. And one of the best ways to do this is keep your ground covered using fertility building crops um, or green manures. Um, and I've just put in a table here of some of the crops suitable for fertility building. And one of the main ones that you'd use maybe in your, your, your first year or two, maybe when you're trying to build fertility is red clover and uh, rye grass. Um, so then the legumes then will fix nitrogen for you. So crop rotation, why you uh, need to maintain, maintain soil quality different types of crops uh, extract different nutrients, they have different root systems, fibrous uh, roots, uh, tap roots, um, so they allow different bacteria and, and, and the ecosystem to develop um, healthily in the soil. Um, avoid pest and disease buildup, uh, you know, pest and disease, are, they, they can be um, not specific to, to certain plant families, but they, they're more associated with certain plant families and rotating between those plant families is important to to avoid um, a buildup of, of a particular pest or disease. Um, you need to, um, crop rotation will help reduce weed problems. Um, it will, and, and then growing a number of crops spreads the risk. So rather than, um, you know, growing a lot of um, one type of crop where all your money is one, or all your eggs are in one basket, um, having a number of crops helps you to spread the financial risk. If you have a bad year in, in one crop, it might be not so bad for another. So this slide just gives you a, a very quick overview of some of the main plant families that you can rotate around. You can see that the main ones there, the cabbage family or the brassica family, carrots, lettuce, potato families, um, and you rotate probably from, from one to the other and then bringing in green manure crops. So I've just put in an example rotation. Um, the other thing just for those that maybe are not in organic production and uh, you know interested in getting into it, before you can become certified organic, um, you have to have a, a two-year conversion period. So in this two-year period, this is year one and two in this rotation, you might be building fertility um, using a green manure crop. So the common one that I mentioned earlier was grass and red clover. Um, and you might have that in, in for, the first, for the first two years. The alternative is um, you can you know, grow vegetables and market your produce as non-chemical um or or just market it conventionally and um, so then the following that now look this isn't it's not set in stone it doesn't have to be like this but this is an option you can go with brassicas and you can go with legumes and such, such as peas and beans or less and other salads and um, onions leeks courgettes and then roots and then you'd follow or you'd restart this cycle in a year two maybe then with a fertility building uh, crop um, just to note as well with this with this rotation green manures alone would not be sufficient to to fertilize or to, to provide the nutrients for, for all these vegetable crops and compost and manure are, are key in this, are critical. So where to get seed and plants? Um, look, there's a, there's a range of, of seed suppliers um, and there are uh, organic vegetable um, plant propagators now in Ireland. So I just, the Chagas publication here, a guide to vegetable growing for anyone that, that's getting into vegetable or is in vegetable and um, production it's it could be a bible for you um, and there's a list of seed suppliers there it's, it's probably the best place to to get that so integrated pest management look this is this is um this is uh, you know key for for all of agriculture now um and I, you know the organic principles are focused and have been focused for for a very long time around around this but it's it's really a, a combination of, of um, using uh, your, the tools that are available to you in the appropriate order um, to control or to manage your pests. Um, so it starts really with prevention and um, reducing risk of, of pests or diseases in your crop. Um, then you'd have things like cultural or sanitation. So that could be things like cleaning down machinery rather than so you're not bringing um, diseases from one field to another. Uh, you've got physical and mechanical. Um, so this could be, you know, removing weeds physically. Um, biological could be uh, in a protected glasshouse system. You know, maybe using uh, natural predators to um, to to um, feed on on pests in tomatoes, for example. Um, and then there are a number of uh, a small number of plant protection products available in organics, but then they'd be used only if necessary and at the um, at the appropriate time if required. So then just, I haven't got 
really time to go into crop specifics, but just some of the, the, the basic weed control um, options in organics. You have crop rotation, you know, you might rotate from crops that are susceptible, more susceptible to weed uh, issues to then rotate to crops that are less susceptible. So, you know, onions, carrots would be more susceptible to, to weed issues. Um, and you might then rotate to, to brassicas um, that maybe are less susceptible or potatoes that have, you know, got that crop cover, they meet across the rows quickly, they'll outcompete um, weeds. Um, well-timed weeding, not too early, too late. You don't want to be ahead of the, the main flush of weeds, but then you don't want to be behind it um, too much either that the weeds can establish and compete with your crop or go to seed. Definitely don't want them to go to seed. Transplanting um, allows crops to get ahead of the weeds. So you're basically giving your, your crop a head start and they can get ahead and outcompete weeds and, and you know, shade weeds and, and um, meet across the road or across the rows uh, earlier. Um, cultural methods, such as sales, seed beds, mulches, crop densities, that's planting crops closer together. Um, you know, same kind of thing, you're out competing earlier. Adjusting sowing dates maybe to, to avoid um, weed pressure. Um, hand weeding, effective, but very uh, time consuming and, and expensive really when, when you add in your labor. Um, so you've got other options such as mechanical weeding, um, the hole with mechanical holes, flame weeders, brush weeders, um, and robotic weeders that are available now, which the um, intensive, um, and not only the intensive um, organic producers are doing, but, but all organic producers now are adopting as much mechanization into their production as possible. So just throwing up a few photographs here of um, flame weeders, the brush weeder, the robotic weeder, and the mechanical hoe. Um, so that if just in case anybody hasn't seen them before. Um, pest control, again, crop rotation, the key, really uh, one of the main cornerstones in uh, organic production. Um, rotating between uh, brassicas, so you have different range of pests that, that are um, that, that have an effect on brassicas to, to the carrot family. Um, encouraging natural predators in the ecosystem. So this could be in your hedgerows, you know, you're, you're encouraging the natural ecosystem. Um, so using barriers, fleeces and bionets, this is just a barrier to stop um, to stop the pest access in your crop. Very common in, in Swedes, um, carrots and other crops. Timing of sowing and planting. Um, so carrots will be maybe sown later um, into June to avoid the, the main, the first generation of carrot root fly um, that comes in May. So this is one of the options that timing is, and this is commonly done in conventional production as well. Um, introduction of predators, um, this is more common for, for protected crops I put in there. Just, you know, you might introduce something like Encarcia or Macrolophus into a glass house to feed on whitefly. Um, and then problem avoidance and earlier identification and monitoring is, is important to, to identify the problem as soon as, soon as you can and, and deal with it early to stop it spreading. Um, that's just a photograph of fleece on a sweet crop, um, which will protect it from cabbage root fly. Um, disease control, again, crop rotation, well discussed at this stage. Resistant varieties, all the organic growers are using resistant varieties um, for diseases, um, very, very important. Um, site selection and soil fertility. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the crop, that the, the crop or the, that the plant isn't stressed. It will, um, you know, stress plants are more um, exposed and prone to, to getting um, diseases. Good husbandry, a, a similar kind of thing, you know, that, that, that the plant is at the right, sown at the right depth, that the, the transplants are incorrectly, um, so that they're not susceptible to disease as much as possible. Um, hygiene, certified seed, clean plants, and dumping crop debris properly and clean machinery. It's common sense, just hygiene, that you're not spreading disease around the, the farm. And again, problem avoidance and early identification. So then just a, a note on extending your season, which is, is very important for organic producers. Um, to, to, you know, it means they can produce all year round in, in some, for some crops. Um, fleeces and meshes, as shown there on the Swedes earlier on, can give you early and late produ uh, production um, and protect you from frost and pests. Polytunnels or Spanish tunnels even are more popular now with, with the increased airflow you can get in them, but they allow early and late production and, and all year round production for, for, for a lot of crops, well, or for some crops really, some salad crops. Um, and they will allow you to produce uh, alternative crops, maybe like tomatoes that you can't produce really out in the field. 
um, and then they're a cheaper alternative to glass houses. Glass houses provide the, the best growing environment and the most stable growing environment, particularly in terms of temperature and humidity. And they will allow you earlier production than polytunnels and also later production. They are expensive, but they obviously last a lot longer than polytunnels. Um, then just briefly go over some of the regulations. If you want to be an organic producer, you have to be registered as a food business operator with the Department of Ag. Um, there are two main organic certification bodies. These are the Organic Trust and the Irish Organic Association. If you want to market your produce as organic, um, you have to be certified as an organic producer by these certification bodies and they carry out annual farm audits. Um, I've just highlighted here for people that may be interested in getting into organic horticulture. These are some of the, the um, organic courses that are around the country. I think Elaine and Joe will, will probably share the slides afterwards. So you'll be able to click those links and find further information if you're interested. Um, this is just some for more information on the grants that are available, the organic farming scheme, the organic capital investment scheme, and the organic processing investment scheme. Again, you probably can click on those links for, for more information if you're interested. And then I have more information here on, on um, more agro agronomic information there for anybody that's interested. So that's it for me. And um, thank you for listening. And we'll welcome questions, I think Joe said, after, after everyone's finished. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Very comprehensive there. Um, yeah, we'll try to put those links and the, those slides up on the Chagas website after as the recording will be going up all, as well. It typically takes a day or two for it to go up, so uh, just bear with us, but we'll try to have it up by the end of the week. Um, so no, very practical, Owen. Covered a lot of the, the key fundamentals there for anyone thinking of getting in and uh, excellent presentation. Um, Padraig, uh, you, you having the presentation, you're going to tell us a story of where you started from and how how you got to where you were. Um, I suppose for, any, for anyone that is interested, um, you held an open day there, Patrick, was it the, just before COVID? Was it the start of 2020, was it? Yes, yeah, I think it was December, December, December 2019. 2019 was, probably. The launch of the walks and, and, and never took never... place then. So uh, yeah, it was the last group we had on the farm. And so, uh, yeah, it was a good, it was, yeah, it was a great, it was well received, it was maybe 150 at the farm walk that day. And there was um there was a booklet prepared for that that day and it's on the Chagusk website. I'd say if you just put in Beach Lawn Organics Chagusk into Google, I'd say it'll take you to where the booklet is. So it'll, it'll if anyone wants a bit more detail on your setup, it's it's there. Yeah, so, and I'm I'm happy to share some send you on as well. And we can upload these on my presentation afterwards as well. I'll send some details. Okay, that's perfect. helpful. I'll hand it um, over to Patrick. Just okay, thanks. I want to welcome everyone joined the presentation tonight and um, so you made the first step on you to come to a webinar and you're, you're looking at moving into organics or or deciding you new entrant into horticulture are you looking at scaling up to field scale or are you a conventional grower who wants to move across so there are three areas uh, of production where people uh, want to move from tonight I'll, I'll cover all the crops that grow here in the farm I'll I look at costs of establishing the farm and then also I'll touch a little bit on cost of crops um, and where I market my crops and, and how I market them. And just before that, I'll, go, I'll give a little bit of a background to the farm. So we're 20 years in existence this year and we've always, we've, I've grown to reflect the market. So we started with half an acre, one tunnel. We sold uh, out of a trailer at a country market in Ballinasloe, and um, we did that for a few years. And then we started going to farmers markets from Ballinasloe, Athlone, or more, my colour. And we grew up to 20 different crops in the polytunnels, and we grew about up to about five to six acres. So that was a period 2002 to 2009. <clears throat> about 20,000 we invested to, uh, to get established then. 2010 to 16, um, things changed with the recession, the markets were falling away, so we had to adapt. And um, I, I up production, um, we had to start supplying more of our own produce. Up till then, I was buying a lot in imports and from other Irish growers. So we did some uh, supplier programs with Super Value, who, who've been a great supermarket to work with along the way for different programs. We were a trial farm on the organic supplier initiative in 2009 10 
and we start to sell direct into shops. Um, just to go back to 0219, 80% of what we sold in that period would have been direct to the consumer and 20% wholesale. Um, within five years, <clears throat> those figures had flipped. And we were wholesaling 80% <clears throat> and selling 20% to the consumer. Um, 2014, we, we, we got out of potatoes. Uh, the land we were working with was um, just too heavy and I could buy them in cheaper off another grower in Donegal and Leash. Um, well, I'll come back into the, that in a little bit. Uh, I started working with other growers, so we subcontract, subcontract and land because we wouldn't have had enough of the land base ourselves. So I started working with other organic growers who grassland. I go in, grow crops in their land for two or three years, an agreed contract, and then uh, leave and put their land then back into grass or into clover. Um, 2016 up till now, uh, we scaled up from 30 up to 40 acres. Last year we did 45. This year I'm cutting back a little bit. My motto this year is do less and try and do it better. Um, so cut back to about 35. Um, we got board B accreditation in 2016. And for the past five, six years, we have grown to 12 to 15 percent each year. Uh, the, uh, the year of the <clears throat> pandemic, we grow up rates of about 20 percent. Um, a little bit on crops, kale. Kale is one of our main crops here. We grow 20 ton, leeks 30 ton, cabbage 60 ton, uh, sprouts about 15 ton, all hand picked. Um, we've quadrupled sales of sprouts in the last two years. So it's something we're really going after. And, and with using the right varieties, getting good advice from agronomist and, and the work I did on the MOPS project with the IOA. So Julian touching that later. So that, you know, that's really helped me. And then salad crops, summer crops, about 10 ton. Um, in 2016, we invested 100,000 in machinery and pack house. And each year at the moment, we're putting 20, 30,000 back into the farm, upgrading equipment, um, packing equipment, fridges and, and vans. Um, 2020, yeah, it was an, a lot of things changed then. We came back and we started going back into potatoes. Uh, and as I said at the very beginning of this slide, we've grown everything to reflect the market. So demand for organic potatoes has really soared in the last few years. Carrots used to be always the biggest thing like potatoes are now. So I'm going back and doing that for two reasons. I need to adapt my rotation because it was it was getting out, it wasn't balanced enough. So potatoes are back in rotation, but I'm, I'm growing for the market demands. And also in 2020 with Brexit, we started, uh, we built a plant propagation unit on the farm. So um, from maybe 2013 on to 2019, you know, you get business advisors telling you specialize, not let someone else raise your plants. But we were buying them all in from the UK, Holland. And um, we said, no, we'll go back doing it. And last year now we raised about 400,000 of our own seedlings on the farm. And along with another grower in Donabate, John Cahill plants, um, he's grown the, the, the rest. And we still import some leeks plants from Holland. But uh, <clears throat> that's, that's worked out really well. So we have a lot more control. And even, what could I say, up to now you'd have to give, give your plan in, in spring, tell someone to raise this amount of plants, but you could react to a market change. So if someone tells you in April, listen, I need more scallions or lettuce, you can plant them and sow them directly yourself react to the market immediately so you have more control uh, you're, you're not paying for transport and uh, yeah and it's it's rewarding and it's it's, one, it's something i've really enjoyed now and um, to, to develop a plant propagation and this year we're putting up a, a new 360 square meter polytunnel to to help with that growth um, just mention rotations briefly uh, grass clover for two years like Owen mentioned followed by brassicas, followed by root crops, <clears throat> followed by brassicas again, or we start with roots, salads, brassicas. So, uh, but always a two year intro with grass, um, clover, and then rest again, and then back into crops. Uh, yeah, um, this year in our rotation, about 50% brassicas. So essentially, I need to introduce more potatoes, root crops 40, and in the balance is potatoes and salads. Um, when you're making changes in your 
rotation, you need to look at it, take a perspective of three years. So two years ago, we'd really poor onion crops. Uh, last year, we, we had the best onions I've ever grown on the farm. Um, it was a really good year for them. Um, you know, so when you make a decision then for the year going forward, you need to take a balanced picture, look at both years, not to go going home and say, yeah, I'm going to double that now. I had a really good year. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I've been very happy we have our own onions up to mid-February. So that's something there where I've really extended the season there. Uh, 98, 99% of onions are imported into the country organically. So there's a big opportunity there. So I'm specialising in that and partner up with someone then to dry them and store them. Uh, challenges there, I've mentioned the increase in brassicas. Uh, Labour is an issue for, for production. And another challenge is also to know your costs. So we, I spend a lot of this time of year inside, looking back on the records of last year um, to see, you know, to see how we've done and see how we can improve things. Um, so we'll just go through these four other headings there, costs. Um, it's with crops establishments. It, it range from 2,000 for turnips and up to 5,000 per acre for leeks. And, uh, Roots, say carrots, parsnips, about three and a half per acre, and parsnips, 4,000. So I find our cost base there is between 2,000 and 5,000 to establish an acre of crops. Um, the, crops <clears throat> the crops I grow, um, potatoes, uh, we do about six acres this year, two to three of onions, five of kale, um, leeks. Six, ton, six acres, cabbage, including red and white, seven acres, a little bit of broccoli, summer crops, then three acres. So that's your intensive salads, scallions, lettuce, spinach, chard, and a little bit of fennel. And then some roots, parsnips, an acre, an acre and a half, two, two acres of suede, beetroot. Um, mixed crops then will be celery, pumpkins, um, squash, and, uh, and then I've allowed for cover crops. Um, some year, other years, I often find I'd be getting crops out of field in July. I'd be really trying to force the system, putting a, a, a second crop in. It's taken me maybe 20 years to, you know, no, don't, you know, don't push the system. Just put that back into grass, rest it again. And the, the rewards, you know, outweigh the financial benefit of going after another crop to get a, a month's lead. And um, because of the nice dry autumn last year, all the uh, cover crops established really well. They're looking really good in the fields now. So uh, yeah, I won't be you know putting in an extra crop. Just get them out in July. Harvest your early potatoes, all your early brassicas, and put a cover crop back in. Um, <clears throat> where we sell our crops? Oh, sorry, where where do we sell our crops? We grow. Um, we sell nationwide. Um, probably half into Dublin. 30% in Galway and then 20% in Clare and the rest of the country. 45% um, of our own, of what we sell will be sold through shops under our own brand. 15% um, would go to consolidators, that's middlemen who then sell on to supermarkets. 15% uh, at the moment is direct to the consumer through web, web shop sales and farmers, uh, or farm gate sales. 10% to the restaurants and then 20% to independents and other producers. So um, I've got a, a good mix there. And it's, it's, I remember chatting to Julian about this before and other people. If one of those drops, like two years ago, that restaurant's dropped. So say that 10% just fell off a cliff, but that 10%, then I was able to steer that into direct sales. So it's important to have a good mix in where you're selling. Um, three years ago, once Consolidator went in for a meeting, just dropped us uh it would have been like 10 15 percent i was able to steer it somewhere else so it's you got to be able to pivot you got to be able to move quickly um and uh you know react so i suppose i got a good mix there um it, it probably takes a lot of mind because you've got all that mix um uh, but it gives you control as well so um so you've got the control you've got different options to to uh, sell to um so that's just a breakdown of how we can sell it and where it goes. And um, yeah, um, we rent 80% of the uh, land we have. And um, 
we're always looking to partner with our, our farmers in our area. Um, last year, I partnered with Nerney Farm, or just rented some land there, working with uh, her son, and they're growing crops on the farm for us. And uh, yeah, so it's it's um, it's challenging work. It's rewarding. Um, get out, get out to field walks, uh, talk to other producers. Um, but there's a market there, and it's grown. Um, gross. If you're coming in, you build your own local market. Um, bring your confidence to it, and, and bring that confidence out of the farm onto the out onto the marketplace, and uh, know your costs. So uh, just leave you that. Know your costs. Know your soil. Okay. Thank you, that's, Joe. That's fantastic, Patrick. Thank you. That's that was brilliant. Um, Know your soil, know your costs. I think is the the motto out of it. But uh, yeah, I love the the approach to the markets as well, where you've you've the multiple uh, outlets for your produce, and not all the eggs are in the one basket. Um, you know, that's so, correct. Yeah, yeah. So no huge huge point. Uh, Gillian, if you're ready to kick off. Okay, can you see the screen? A thumbs up there from someone? Yep. That's perfect. Okay, yeah. That's great. Um, good evening. My name is Gillian Westbrook. I'm the CEO of the Irish Organic Association. Uh, we are a certification body. And just to be clear, certification bodies just, uh, we don't just do certification, we do an awful lot more, but you're actually a member of our organization. So you're actually part of the, of the association when you join. So slightly different to, to a lot of other setups. Um, in terms of sort of uh, assurances on, on certification, shall we say. So it's, a, it's uh, been an interesting project that we were involved in here with PORIG, um, initially set it up by asking me a question about sustainability and it got a few of us around his breakfast table one morning and we decided to put together an EIP called Maximizing Organic Production Systems. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details this evening about um, the, the setting up and, and, and the project itself like that. I'm just really going to focus in on some of the results. But um, the Irish Organic Association was the lead partner and the author. And um, we had 11 superb farms and a really strong team of people, an excellent team of people. Um, John Hogan was the agronomist, which um, many of you will know. Um, Peter uh, Jones was the botanist. Uh, William DC was the lead researcher, uh, Grace Maher was communications and field data, um, Mary Lynch, Noel Groom, uh, sorry, Noel Clinton, beg your pardon, and um, Paula Pender, and I can't think of it, and then of course all the 11 farms. So I just wanted to mention people, it's the first time I have done that, I know it's not the Oscars, but I really do like to just say um, an epic piece of work, and um, I, I just I suppose if they are listening, I'm sorry for driving everyone so hard, I know everybody was driven very hard on this project, but it did, it, the, the proof in the pudding, as they say. Um, so really, um, just the farms that were, um, I want to focus in on the farms, because that's what it's about. Um, so the farms that were in the, um, the project, we can see the 11 farms here and their geographical spread. Um, as you can see, to the east of the country, there's maybe not quite as many, much of a spread we would have liked to have seen. Um, but this particular group had been, um, or most of them, 90% of them, uh, were working as an agronomy group prior to the project setting off. So it was a really good idea to... Um, actually work with a group of people where I suppose a certain level of trust and involvement working together was already established. Um, and just uh, for the sizes of the farms, um, some of the farms are very small from one hectare. Uh, so there was three uh, other very, uh, other very small farms. And then as you can see here, they were, they were quite evenly divided. Now the, the larger farms there, as I say, that also includes um, their livestock and cereal production because that would have been part of their rotations. So it was a very good mix. I'm not going to get into the detail of the MOPS project, um, other than to say that the main objective was really to deliver and implement a, a cropping programs to, so, the, so that we could improve the continuity of supply, reduce the surplus or waste, or in my um, opinion, it is all about economics, and then better integrate that into the short supply chains. So basically, um, we got together as this group 
and um, we decided that we would produce something at the end that wasn't just, it wasn't an economic model, it's what we weren't going to produce. What we wanted to do is to produce something that was actually to the farmer and more importantly to other growers in the future. Um, so we did an awful lot of monitoring, monthly monitoring and farm visits, etc. Um, we installed climate monitors, weather, uh, uh, weather gauges and things for relative humidity, soil, air temperatures, um, recorded every, every three seconds. So we, we, it was quite onerous. Um, that's all data um, sort of stuff that's set up remotely on farm, which is uh, just downloaded afterwards. And then we did a very detailed survey of all the crops on a monthly basis. So yields, um, harvesting, um, sales, trade, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a huge amount of monitoring. And then we also engaged with the industry as well, uh, the retailers and, as Parag uh, said earlier, consolidators, which are basically the distributors and packers that you'll find in between. And also very important, um, certainly if you're going to be dealing with retail, um, to be engaging with, with all, all of those people at an early stage. Um, and in addition, we had um, a green manure trial, just to add to it, because we didn't think there was enough work to do in three years. We also chucked in a green manure trial as well, which was quite comprehensive and um, got some pretty um, exciting results, um, which can all be read. I'll, I'll talk about that later. And a technical note done, um, William DC there did a really excellent technical note. It was supposed to be a compost trial, um, but that wasn't actually of much use to anyone reading it. It was only of any use to the farmer. So we decided to take all the various inputs and analyze them, everything from anaerobic digest, uh, digestate to um, various compost being brought in. Um, one thing we did notice that often the smaller farms were actually maybe um, tempted, I suppose, to maybe buy in a lot of compost things that weren't needed. So again, it had a very economical, an economic in, in, impact on, on getting the right inputs for your soils. And in addition to that, um, Grace Maher did a fabulous job on, on, um, uh, on the videos, basically recording all the relevant points, because this was something really we had to focus in on is how are we going to get all this information out to people? And where the um, John Hogan, um, being that we couldn't clone him, apparently it was illegal, uh, we had to actually capture all this information with John and this communication with him and the grower. So Grace got the task of, um, of going out with various cameras. I say various because some of them got wet. We had to replace them because there was a lot of rain. And um, monitoring the whole thing throughout. So all of that has been disseminated down. And all of that information was then put into a gatekeeper, which is a, an agronomist software package. And the data was analyzed. And then, uh, then basically we had to write the whole thing up. And in doing so, we've produced a grower's report, um, which is the short version. And I really would strongly recommend you opt for that one if you're, if you're looking into it. And for the more academic of you, there is a full um, rather epic report, which is about 10,000, 100,000 words actually. So um, I had, so we've got it on soft copy. Please don't hit the print button if you are ever looking that up. So I will just talk on the markets, but I would just want to go back again, just remember the green manure trial and the compost notes are really, really, really useful um, and, uh, and certainly provide an awful lot of uh, very valuable information there. So uh, I will go and focus in on the markets as we've got limited time, but um, those two particular aspects obviously are, are fundamental, fundamental to anybody in growing. So the results, so 100 and oh, cheeky, actually 112% increase uh, from 2017 to 2020. So um, yes, by the way, in case anyone does write it up as a question, these were audited, accountancy audited, okay? So that they weren't just random figures that we took. Um, so basically from, uh, basically 2019, with 2019, the project started in 2018. So we had to obviously go to the, to the year before. Uh, we can see that we the, the sales uh, increased from 3.8 uh, million to 8.1 million as a combined of, of the whole project. That's all to, all 11 farms. So um, uh, you know everyone would like that to be higher, of course. But I, I I was very impressed with that. I was delighted to see that come through. I'm just going to focus a little bit here on that 2019-2020 because when we're going to be reading reports either this year or next year, everyone's going to be talking about that COVID year. Um, but if you look at the year prior to COVID, you will see that trajectory is any there, uh, is existing. So anybody um, listening tonight from an economic background, you will um, notice that that actually is quite a common when you see that in terms of sales. So COVID had its play, its part to pay, but um, 
it wasn't just about COVID, that's for sure. So really looking at what changed over that time, I suppose we can see here that we've got the uh, multiple retailer supermarket in the last year of the project. We'll see that um, uh, the change there around the 21 percent and um, that that's in the in the in the retail sector and then in the um, direct sales, etc. That went up by the 81 percent. Now, COVID clearly had a big part to play in that because obviously we had a 40% drop in the uh, catering sector, um, um, food service sector, uh, although it wasn't, huge, well, I say it wasn't, it wasn't that significant in terms of the overall project. It was, it was highly significant to the grower impacted by it. Um, but this is where we see a really interesting change in, in, in the project um, because where we look at that 21% year over year growth, that direct selling, is what really kicked that in with that plus 81. But it was an awful lot more of, of, of an economic impact than just in sales, because what it was really effectively picking up here was that you weren't you were offsetting your your waste, your 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 surplus product. And in a lot of occasions, um, products that maybe didn't meet market specifications for the retailer, i.e. it wasn't the exact length or weight or something, but still perfectly um, perfectly edible, fantastic products. So, I mean, there's no reason that these things should should be end up in a compost. So this is really the collaborative approach I want to talk about. This is what MOPS is really about. How do you get these people to work together, these various farms, and without and still remain independent as individual? And that's what these, these results are really, really alluding to. So, for example, on the, um, these are really summary results, I must admit there's an awful lot more detail in the project, but so the, the turnover, as you can see here, was, was at 40% um, in the last year of the 11 um, growers as a combined turnover was, was up 40%. And then the total sales uh, are of the of the project growers, again, of their own crops, okay, was up 11%. And the two more interesting figures that I find is the trade between the MOPS grower. And as I said, this is really about a collaborative approach and they increased by 62%. And then the fresh produce from um, Irish, including Northern Ireland growers, other than the MOPS project increased by a staggering 371%. And then imported uh, non-Irish fresh produce, you can see there is 119%. So, I mean, while we imported a lot of product, for example, the, I mean, with an overall greater value, I'd have to say, it's still that increase of 119%, you know, would like to see that down a little bit, um, that bottom in terms of imports. But what we also saw is that the growers substituted nearly 10% of, of non-Irish imported product in that last year. So if you were doing that every year by 9 10%, it wouldn't take long to have quite a significant impact on your overall trade. So, um, it, it's it, it, it's saying a lot, shall we say, in terms of, of a combined approach. And we often hear about the fragmentation of the market and what's why organics hasn't done well. I would say, actually, maybe that's one of the reasons that it will do well in the future, because it's looking at short supply chains, it's looking at work together. It's very unique in the fact that it does that. And I think it gives them a huge added advantage. On the multiple side, on, on the retail side, um, there was a retail report done, interviews with the retail and as we can see here, the retailers predicted double digit growth uh, for 2021. But in um, in the retail report here uh, that you see in the slide in front of you, this was really showing you what was what the main products were that were, were being sold at that time. Um, so it's quite an interesting one. It's often there's, there's a lot of products in there that we don't capture because it's in catering. But this is really retail being supermarkets and more talking supermarkets. And then for the projected volume of, of organic veg for 2021, this is what they project, projected that they would be able to sell um, over that time. So they've obviously taken a worst, medium and best case scenario. And again, looking at, at, the, at the best selling crops, um, that was the key there was to not try to include everything. But um, these are, uh, are accurate, I would say, to, in, in, in the, the model and the robustness in which they approach this, um, but I'd say probably slightly conservative. And I think people could do uh, more again. And do bear in mind, this doesn't cover farmers markets and direct sales. And where we saw the real significant growth was actually coming from that. And so the mainstream, I, I wanted to focus a little bit um, here just on some of the, uh, the mainstream vegetables. Um, 
um, for the less mainstream, I should say, vegetables here, because a lot of these products are, are not ones that maybe people look at so much. And certainly for the smaller growers, the mixed leaves, the, the it's not on there, but it is in the project, um, the, the things like Jerusalem artichokes and stuff like that. A, a lot of these things, um, these crops are very high value as well. If you look at them individually and, and, and look at their, um, their cost as a unit, it's... Uh, um, so these, again, are the ones that they, they believed at retail level. But I would say a lot of the crops that we were looking at, too, for the catering, um, as well, it, it, once that picks up again post, um, post COVID, I say post COVID, it's supposed to be post COVID-ish now, isn't it? Um, but those are the products that, um, from an economic point of view, were very attractive. So on the videos that um, uh, Grace Maher, who also works for the Irish Organic Association, we did all these various videos. These can all be found. I know I was um, mentioned to Owen there earlier. He said he's been looking at some of them. They are very practical and really, I I'd hope, very useful. We certainly put a lot of work into capturing it all. And um, in terms of the report, um, as an end result, we had two reports. We had the um, Maximizing Organic Production growers report which is in hard copy and if you contact the office we will very happily post you on out the other report um, is on the website on our website there you can see this is the full report and as i said please don't hit the print, print button because it, it is enormous um, but there's a huge amount of detail in that but in the growers report um interesting uh um, on that that what we've really looked at is is all the various things that we thought growers would like to know um, and obviously without giving private and personal um, confidential economic uh, financial detail from farms we didn't want to get into that per farm but as a group we, we, we've covered that side but it, it's um uh, growers are really coming back with what's really useful is to know the sowing rates, the dates, the spacing, the days to maturity, the plant density, the expected harvest that you would get for all the crops, and absolutely fundamental, what variety did they use? And so that's exactly what we've done in this growers report. It goes through all of the, well, pretty much all of the crops, and it tells you what the various varieties and all that detail is in there. And so it's... Um, uh, as one grower said to me very recently, it's absolute gold dust, something like this. It's, it's, uh, it, it's needed. And if you are a, a professional grower, um, all of that information is, is in there. Um, so that was really uh, what the project was about. And I think, I think it has to be pointed out at this stage that um, apart from saying thank you to the, to the farmers, that, that uh, the 11 farms that did a fantastic job on this and um, um, we know there was a vast amount of paperwork and we did uh, um, a, a lot of requirements, shall we say, on everybody to, to get this over the line. Um, one of the key things is that we'll hear this on the KPMC report, etc., that the fragmentation, that this, this uh, what a lot have perceived over the years to be the, the, what holds the organic side back, I would say, is actually why they did so well. I, when I say I would say this is my opinion and it's somewhat anecdotal, but um, certainly that is why they were survived so well through, through COVID. They traded with each other. They worked reasonably, professionally, and um, did a fantastic job on turning it around and they turned it quickly. And so whereas many would have once said, um, it was only a couple, oh, I'll say a couple, it was literally from four years ago actually, that people were saying that you couldn't really have, for example, direct sales and that you shouldn't be doing with retail. You do one or the other, you can't do both. Well, Porig, you proved them everybody wrong on that 10 times over. It really did a fantastic job on that because when the COVID um, um, hit and we needed uh, um, uh, deliveries, direct, direct sales, et cetera, this is where the likes of Porig and all the other growers, they changed and they flipped overnight and they basically took a different business model, they implemented it. And I think, as I said at the end, uh, 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 the other slide on, on the market, that the proof in the pudding is there. It was excellent and they did a fabulous job. And they did that over a very, very challenging time with um, very, uh, um, well, great difficulty, I think, across the board and trying to get staff, et cetera, and all the other problems that they incur generally with that. So to pull that off was fabulous. I think they would have, uh, I think if we continued to do mops for the next few years, we would see this trajectory grow. But one thing is very important, and you saw that initial slide at the beginning where the locations, all of these farms are either dealing with retail or involved uh, in, in quite a professional way, and they can all be, people can learn from each of those farms. 
And I think it's really important to look at the videos and look out for farm walks on these places and go talk to them. Because I, I, I know the, the likes of Beach Lawn, et cetera, he also buys from an awful lot of other farms as well. So there's not all the 11 farms are suitable to act, for example, as a hub for distribution and short supply, um, because they're only maybe selling their own, uh, own products. They're not importing in from other, other farms, but some of them are importing in from other farms. And if you work with them, you will go a lot further and short supply chains are certainly what everybody wants and from a retail point of view if you can get it to the shelf with an organic logo on it it sells and they've proved that and I think they've done a fabulous job thank you very much thank you Gillian um, fantastic project and it just shows the what the, the power of what bringing people together can do um, and I suppose your your last slide there that you had that link um, Irish Organic Association Forward Stroke EIP um, is where everyone, it's, it's well worth a look for anyone that is thinking of getting into starting up a horticulture business or scaling up. Um, it's a fantastic report with a lot of very practical uh, information that is very usable for uh, anyone thinking of commencing a, a horticultural business. Elaine, have we questions? Yes, we have, Joe. Let's start. Um... Uh, first question, will organic registration ever be open to smaller growers below two hectares? And where does cap reform fit in with organics? And why are organic growers so low in the Republic of Ireland, one of the lowest in Europe? And will we ever each ever reach our 7% target? So maybe just open that up maybe to Gillian and, and Porig, your own opinions and from your, from your perspectives maybe? As regards the registration, open to smaller growers, maybe from the registration side, maybe Gillian on that. Yeah. Can you hear me there okay? Yes, perfect. Oh, yeah. Sorry, it's, it's a little thing coming up on my screen. Um, the registration is, is open to anybody and um, it's not it's not restricted to that size. It's the organic farming scheme payments that stands to restrict size because um, it probably wouldn't really pay you to be applying if, if, if you were... Um, um, a couple of hectares but what you can do is, is um, apply get your certification and in that we inform the department that you're uh, you might not get an organic farming payment but what you can do is avail of all the grants that goes with it so your your TAMS grants and that sort of thing you can still avail of all of that level of support um, so it is open to everybody yeah and there has been under the cap and um, the Irish Organic Association has a cap for a seat on the cap committee consultation committee for the last two years so I'm not going to dwell on crap here because we this could be a long long night um, but on, on the cap certainly going forward that there has been suggestions of a small farmer scheme we haven't seen the strategic plan nobody has the final one only the department will have seen the final one that has to be approved by Brussels but uh, it is possible that there will be a one-off payment for um, small for small farms to avail of but I'm not I don't know until we actually see the final the final version okay 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 uh, Paul did you any comment maybe would you like to add anything um, just I suppose on veg production um, in Ireland yeah, it's, it's a minority sport um, you know and even in conventional veg 50 60 percent of produce imported uh, in organics is around 65 70. Um, you know, the OGI have a, about 300 growers involved with them, um, and there's a, there's a couple of hundred growers uh, registered. You know, it's a lot of people would be doing tillage, they might be keeping sheep, but they grow some potatoes or grow some crops. There is a lot to growing it. And I, the question will we ever reach 7%? It, it's, I think we will because we have to, you know, and uh, I have no doubt we will. Uh, the reforms are coming. Uh, Ireland's been a laggard uh, in, in this, you know, for the past 25 years. So it's, it's the, the reforms are coming and um, I think there'll be a lot of change there next year. But what I say to people on the webinar tonight, don't wait for the, the reforms next year. Get in and, and be joined this year because if you get in sooner, you'll be able to access the market. So, so register uh, this year and join the organic scheme where you can. And... Um, yeah, there's challenges in our climate growing vegetables. Uh, like in the west of Ireland, where I live, you know, 12, over 1,200 mils of rain. You know, that can be challenging. We've had a really lovely winter. I've never had a winter like this. So it's, it's 
So it, it's mm. it's it's not all positive. It, it's a hard it's a hard graft as well. You know, grown veg all year round, but it's rewarding. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully okay. I've answered the question there. Thank you, Borg. Yeah, just in relation, there's a comment here in relation to can Ireland develop peat alternatives and create an internal production of our go of organic growing meeting media composting etc so not to reply on Im not to rely on imports have any comments maybe on that um i know there are some or oh, do you want to come in or, or i know there are some actually yeah there are pea free compost at the moment i use both um the, the pea free one isn't isn't perfect it can cap a little bit um you know so there's some produced in uh, donegal um and the the Claire is right there, yeah. The others come in from Classman. And um, yeah, so I'd like it, that'd be great to close that circle. And I, I'm sure there is a way to uh, start producing that in the country. Oh, and have you any comment maybe from your experience? Yeah, just to say that um, the Chagas HDD uh, is working on, on that. And there's a Beyond um, Peat project um, that's been funded recently and that's that's up and running. So, um, or up and running shortly, if not already. Um, so that that will look at, at, at directly replacing peat. Um, so look whether there is a direct replacement is, is another thing. But but that's that's the aim of that project. Um, and as as Porik outlined there, there are some um, some organic growers and, and growers using alternative um, substrates. But um, just to just to say that that project is is uh, happening at the moment. Okay, well, thank you. Porik, back to you again. Just a couple of people wondering, where do you source your seeds from? Um, <clears throat> a few companies, uh, Europrise um, primarily, and then we source some seeds from the seed savers for specialised varieties. Um, CN seeds, uh, we also get salad leaf varieties, and uh, Chris Bollard as well, he's another seller of seeds, we get some from him. And then I reference leek plants. We buy in leek plants from Dutch suppliers. We buy in the plants direct from Holland. And uh, yeah, there's a mix there, but your price primarily, very happy to work with them. Okay, and just back to you again, there's a few questions in here about uh, uh, pork in relation to onions. How do you manage uh, onions into the rotation? Yeah, to be every minimum three, four years. Uh, like I said, I, it was, I've grown that from a half an acre a few years ago this year, maybe two, two and a half acres. So it's easy to work those in under the root section. Um, talked earlier about brassicas, roots, salads, and then grass crops. So you'd probably come in, this, I wouldn't come in after grass because the build up may, might be too much roots. So probably second in the rotation. So brassicas followed by roots and onions will be in there. Um, I think well, I've touched on yeah, the I touched manure, on the grown media green, question green, already. Yeah. And green manures, what have what experience, what green manures have you used? Um, everything, um, mm. say red clover, phacelia, um, Japanese uh, oats, um, Persian clover, um, you know, trefoil, white clover. And uh, yeah, we, I, we, I get a lot of those from fruit of the farm, so they've um, got a good mix there. And then maybe your plant protection measures. What plant protection measures are would you be using? Uh, nets in the field uh, for birds. Um, we use a, a compostable foley um, for um, our crops in the ground, and that and that keeps the crops healthier, heats up the soil at the beginning of the season. And there's also a product you can use for caterpillars called Lepinox. And uh, yeah, so Lepinox, but primary prevention first nets. And uh, if you get some damage, you can live with that. But nets, um, yeah, nets. Nets will be the main thing. And somebody here is wondering about your potatoes. Uh, how do you grade your potatoes and harvesting and uh, storage? <clears throat> we'd harvest the early potatoes uh, by an old mechanical harvester. And that requires picking them up and bagging them. And then we, we wash them all and we sell them small ones in baby potatoes and then sell the rest into shops or wholesale. And then the autumn harvest will be harvested mechanically, put into bins and put into a fridge to store at three to four degrees and take them out as you need them. And uh, we don't, I wouldn't leave potatoes in the ground in the west of Ireland. 
and um, yeah, so get them out in storage. So it's, it's very important to plan your storage. Okay, next question. I have a question. There's two questions here so about somebody regarding cover crops in the form of, in the form of winter rye and impossible to kill by crimping. Can the rye crop cover the, uh, be left? Have you seen any more effective methods? Any experience within the group in relation to winter rye? I think this person may be talking about minimum. God, less, yes. You know, yes. Is, but now plowing, I'm guessing. Yeah, so I, yeah, I have yeah. an experience in that. I, I, I know I've rotated and brought in sheep or, you know, got permission to bring in animals to kind of graze back uh, strong cover crops. And I'm even looking at that now. Um, no, I, I don't really have the experience here on, on this question. Would you say, Pork, maybe, sorry, sorry I'm just going to just bounce something off you. Maybe would you say possibly it could have been a very high rate of rye in, in the in the, the mix maybe and um, that maybe if they had a higher clover rate it might have been easier to to to, to mulch back in what uh, just bouncing that off you what do you think possibly and it's just <clears throat> i suppose that's it's it's grabbing all the nutrients that are there so it's it's it's, it's grabbing it's um it's taking up all the late nutrients that are there after the season um so i'd go in and top it and but we plow so that's our system rather than you know uh, minimum till uh, but uh, yeah i probably you're right maybe get a better mix into your cover crops for the winter and the next question is in relation to uh, weed control fabric just using weed control uh, uh, fabric uh, common could this lead to unwanted micro microbiological build up beneath the fabric by reducing airflow to the soil and seed on bed what would your thoughts be on that? Um, I suppose no, I, I, I'd say. Um, and the foley I use, it's black compostable plastic um, that breaks down after 8, 10, 11 weeks and it goes back into the soil. So, um, yeah, I don't, have a, I don't have any problems with it. But you know, it, it, there's no one testing the soil scientifically, you know, so I, I can't answer it honestly. Yes. Um, and reducing airflow to the soil. Hmm, it, some air will get underneath, but no, I don't, I don't, I don't find that a problem, Roger. And back to you again, sorry, Pori, what fertilizer are you using? Uh, we choose, get some fertilizer from Fruit of Farm, um, White Sagri, and then we use for farm air manure and poultry waste. Okay, thank you. Them on the farm. Maybe just in a question in relation to the standards that are there are there standards that are in place for using cardboard as a weed barrier in organic farming? Uh, maybe Gillian, you might. Is there? Um, yeah, yes, you can. I mean, actually, it really depends. If, for example, although it's an EU regulation, uh, and uh, hence it should be the same applied across the EU, uh, the, the countries like Denmark, for example, wouldn't classify cardboard as a household waste. So, because it's not defined as a household waste, they wouldn't allow it in 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 with um, for use on crops. We uh, in Ireland and many other countries don't really see that the same. It depends. Now, if you're if you're chopping up cardboard and putting it through. Um, to reduce some of your mold bills up and things. It really depends on what's on the cardboard. If there ever is a problem on something like that, we can always look at it. And that would be certainly something that would be maybe worth a, um, um, a, a more further analysis, to be honest. Is there an extrapolation basically between, between the cardboard and what's in it and it going into the product? But you can use uh, other composted household waste. So really, if the cardboard is used um, either in that way and, and it's permittable or more importantly, if it's just being used as a barrier, uh, as that question probably refers to, then we wouldn't really have a huge issue with it. But we'd have to look at it on a case by case. I mean, if it's all cardboard, we would probably have to say something about it. But it's other many other countries don't have a problem with classifying it as a household waste in small quantities. And just somebody maybe uh, in relation to hydroponic growing, EU does not, as we know, regard hydroponic growing as organic while the US does. Do you see any movement in the EU, EU to recognize hydroponics as organics where only organic nutrients are used? Any comments there? 
I don't see I don't see I don't see any movement in it. it it doesn't there's no movement in the new regulations on it and the whole um aspect of that is not farm it's not part of the whole farm approach so your external benefits that you get your external attributes etc it wouldn't really be um they wouldn't be achieved um in terms of uh, you might get the food juice but you don't get the whole system approach which is basically what it's all about um, so that's why the hydroponics isn't really approved at EU level. We've got a good market at the EU. We don't want to weaken it with something like hydroponics. Good luck to the men and women who are growing in hydroponic. Uh, that's fantastic for you. But in organic systems, you've got a good product. You don't need to change it. And I think to try to weaken it like that would be a very, very bad move from a market. Okay, uh, just in relation to a comment here that they've not, I've noticed some small growers are comfortable growing using organic methods, but are not getting certified organically and just simply marketing themselves as chemical free. What are the main advantages for a grower getting certified with an organic association? Uh, does baby... it is. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the, the main advantage to it is that you're part of something you, you're part of um um obviously it's the only agroecological guaranteed system that's defined by law in the whole of europe and if you are a small grower and the 200 euros which will probably be for around a hectare is actually what's stopping you going into organics um if you can't make up at least that difference or a lot more than that difference um in your added sales because it's organic then we've all failed and it's not failing it's growing and so it shouldn't be a barrier and it is around 200 euros starting for certification so it shouldn't really be prohibitive and if it is prohibitive then it is a voluntary scheme Just so an anecdotal. the advantages are yeah. that you're joining something yeah sorry yeah, yes, you know, Julian, yes. just i i found there uh, early sage of covid it was growers who were working in the chemical free space they they were always selling into restaurants, uh, wholesalers, and then they lost that market. And then they were coming to me and I said, and I knew they grow it chemical free, but I can't buy from them. Uh, I also know there was a, quite a large box scheme that used to work with chemical free, local, organic. Two years later, they're fully organic. Because the consumer also wants a clear message. It doesn't want the, the it, it muddy message. So it's, uh, you know, but being a member of the IOA, say, 19, 20 years, very happy with that. But it's just, I think the consumer wants clarity. And um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's the way forward. OK, thank you. Um, just, Horik, just a question for you regarding a wash station. If you could comment, please, do all <coughs> veggies require washing prior to packing or is it field direct customer? And is our government body involved with the standards that need to be met with washing? Uh, let me see, is there a government body? At the moment, yeah, well, say all the water we use for washing goes into a tank and that's put back out in the land uh, during the season. We put out a tank or so. We, under our Borbia standards, we, we can't say let wastewater go into drain. So we're, we're members of the IOA, but also certified with Borbia or in the Borbia quality assurance sure. scheme. So, you know, um, so that deals with the water. Um, as I said earlier, 15% uh, we sell direct to consumers, so, but we just wash, we wash the veg for shops. Um, and then we'll have some also there for our direct sales. Um, yeah, there are some crops I don't need to, but it, it, it suppose we have to work with quality and once something's washed, I can see it and check it. It, that does bring up the issue you have a bit more waste so we work with food cloud um and we we give it to other charities where we can sell something uh, i want to start processing produce on the farm as well for you know maybe soups juices instead of having waste but uh no it's that's the space we're in um we've got our own well we've got two wells actually three wells between the the, tr the three locations and uh, we use our own water we gather the wastewater and then that's put back out in the land. And just maybe somebody just missed there. What's the name of the biodegradable plastic that you're using, Porik? Uh, let me see if I can find the Organic Matters magazine. I give them it's it's uh, Samco. He's, no, he's yeah, Samco. Yeah, sorry, I'm yeah, Samco. Uh, were featured on Ear to Ground about three weeks ago. Um, so yeah, it matches shine, it's the sales person there. 
and they're producing that for in Ireland and for export around Europe. So Samco. Okay. Thank you. Gillian, can sheep wool or animal wool be used as a mulch? Um, I don't have, I don't see why not. I'd actually have to check it out. In fact, um, normally I just look across to Angela, um, our certification manager who answers this like, um, like the encyclopedia that she is. I, I, I don't see a reason why not. It wouldn't make sense to, it would probably depend on any treatments or anything. Um, I, I can certainly come back to you. Um, I don't see a, a, it. It does. It wouldn't be logical that it would be prohibited without good reason. Okay. Okay. No, but you don't have any experience uh, of using organic wool as a weed barrier. We don't in the audience. That's okay. We move on to the next. Uh, um, as a comment, I suppose. Why? Um, just maybe somebody there on the subject of wells, uh, Porg. Do you think is a single well sufficient for a one hectare small? holding including supplying the household what yeah no that that um I suppose when you put in your well it will tell you the pressure and you get an idea of the volume that can come out of that well per hour and um so the well we have for our house also covers our polytunnels but when we went to field production we got in an, an extra well um but just if i heard that correctly is it under an acre or a hectare a hectare one for a one hectare small hole yeah but when you're drilling the well you'll know you'll find out the capacity and what's the potential for that well and work out your figures what needs you have in your house but yeah it's worked for us for 18 years a well and for the house and for the polytunnels and the pack house Okay, and just a comment here, somebody looking at regenerative versus organic, just a comment, why is limited use of pesticides allowed in organics? Is that for weighing up or regenerate? Yeah. Gillian, um, um, can you come in there? I don't, um, like pesticides i don't we don't we don't use pesticides pesticides, um, pesticides wouldn't be you would we be correct in that Gillian? no you wouldn't be using pesticides in organics sure that's you're muted there Gillian. sorry i just want more detail on the question Basically, I, I mean, certainly if there's, um, I mean, in, in, in vegetable production, I just want to know, it depends what you decline. I mean, people, I mean, if something is a, is a pesticide, I mean, garlic, crushed garlic is a pesticide. It depends what you define. I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding with um, having to look at um, courses on, on use of pesticides. Um, as dull as it sounds, I'm sorry, but actually really people do have to learn how to use them because regardless of, um, of what you're, um, uh, and how you're applying it and, and the application rates and things like that. So it, they're all classified as pesticides. It doesn't have to be synthetic. So maybe Owen actually would be better well, on that question. I was just going to add, Gillian, I think maybe like you're saying, there might be a bit of confusion there just between plant protection products. The term maybe is, is mm -hmm. the term pesticides, maybe it's just being confused slightly. Um, and probably in the organics, you use plant protection products, but not necessarily the, what, what everyone, what the, the general public might consider a pesticide. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe that's what's happened there. Uh, just another, just a couple coming near the end here now, but just a comment here: Is it practical to grow organically using hydroponic systems? I do not know. We touched on it earlier. Yes, it's, yeah. it's not compatible. You know, um, this, yeah. the consumer doesn't want it. Um, you know, that's maybe more into vertical farming, and and one of the basic principles of organic is 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 the crops are grown in the soil, so it's. It's at odds with the founding principles. Yeah, just a follow on from the question about organic certification. If a grower grows using organic methods without chemicals, surely they should be free to, mar to market the products as organic with, with the onus being on the organic, the OA, the Organic Association Certification Body, for example, to verify it. Um, do you want to make a comment? <laughs> 
sorry, I just on on the we couldn't if 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 you mean you don't have to be certified, but you're still going to use it. it it's, it's defined in law. That's why it's there. Yeah. And of, of course, we understand that people don't want to go through that that uh, procedure. And that's why it's voluntary. And that's why we have to do it. And if everyone was 100 percent honest, and there was never any food fraud or all of those things that have been happening for hundreds of years, then we wouldn't have to go and check it. But that's what the consumer pays for. And that's what it's about. And so if you want yeah. to do it without you have to if you want to use it, you have to get certified. And same as like, you know, if you drive a car, you got to have a license. Yeah. A question here in relation to any, have, does either, anybody have experience with using compost tea as a fertilizer for Um, Or Owen, have you come across that? And if so, how are they using it and how often is it applied? I did it a few years ago after uh, doing a course of laning them. Um, and I used some biodynamic preparations, horse tail. And uh, yeah, I found it good for tunnel crops in this summer. Uh, really, for me, it's about getting getting the nutrients right and getting the soil right at the beginning, rather than have to come in to intervene. But uh, I've had a little bit of experience. But I'll be honest, it's I find you're so busy trying to keep up with other things. Sometimes you know it's hard to fit that in as well. Um, but uh, no, there's a lot of good research there. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, if you can fit it into your work program and if you if you have time for it. But uh, uh, we had a, an oxygenator pumping oxygen into the water for like thirty six hours and then uh, diluting that mix and then putting it out on the tomatoes. But it, it just took up a lot of time. We weren't efficient how we were doing it. Um, you know, we were, you, you can use teas. Your comp, comp we used uh, molasses, some liquid seaweeds, uh, and your compost and. Uh, Worked well in the tomatoes, but it's it's not. We, I'm not at it full time now. Just to, to add, yeah, yeah. I I haven't any uh, direct experience with that. But if that uh, attendee wants to email me, um, my details are there, and, and I might have some notes on it. Maybe that I can I can root out for okay. for that to follow up on that one. Yeah, and maybe just maybe my, oh, and this next one you might comment on it is as regards to what are the views on biological controls or mixes of biological with other plant protection, especially in polytunnels. You would, what? Well, I, I mean, it's it's. I suppose you you go back to the IPM triangle. Um, and you're pre you're preventing having a problem in the first place. You're you're using resistant varieties or, or or you know other cultural methods. Then after that, and then. Eventually, you might get onto biologicals after after physical. Um, so if if it's if it's part of your your program, like I'd say, pork probably I would imagine uses um biologicals in his glass house, um as as most protected crop growers would. So if if they're required, um, it's it's part part of it. Um, it's it's allowed in in organic production, um. Unless Julian's going to correct me there, but um, no, you're then, right, on. Yeah, yeah I yeah. use it for cucumbers. Definitely, we used to have a big problem with red spider mite. Uh, we get, I can't think of the names. We get them from Unicamp. Phytocelis uh, persimilis, I think, isn't it? Uh, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's a funny yeah. uh, Latin name. Yeah. But it's yeah, we bring it in, put them in after two weeks, and it's we don't have an issue there with spider mite. Um, yeah, no, it's it's. And then I think they're the main ones uh, on on. Uh, <clears throat> In, in tomatoes um, and, and for white fly as well, pork, you probably use some of those ones, would you as well? Yeah, I do. And would it be right in saying even like across conventional tomatoes now, or, you know, main industries move that way, it's, it's using yeah. biological methods. And that's what that's what Jillian and I were just talking about just beforehand, that, you know, the conventional um, production is getting closer and closer to organics and, um, you know, conventional is adopting the IPM triangle um, that organics has been using for, for a long time. Um, and the tomato growers in conventional production will be will be um, will be using a lot of those uh, biological controls as well. I'd like to thank Claire for her very good questions, uh, Claire Lyons. So really, yeah, really, yeah talk, kept you on your talk, toes. Talk through, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? No, I think have we? Yeah, I'd say you've, you've got through them there, Lynn, yes. The one, yes, one last one here, last one. Uh, what for Pori? What does he? What does he feel is the big, biggest thing that ho that hold his business back from moving forward? It can be yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But we're 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 all my own, greatest strength and my own weakness. Uh, 
maybe at the moment labor uh, and then a healthy relationship between the farmer and the supermarket in Ireland. Yeah, so there needs to be a, a healthy, yeah, mature relationship there. At the moment, it's, it's one-sided. So, um, yeah, Stephen, I think I know you. Um, yeah, so the, the relationship between supermarkets and, and producers. And, um, and another one, you're asking yeah, the one yeah. big one. I just suppose the cost, you know, let's be honest, cost of being a business, cost of producing food in Ireland is greater than southern Spain, um, southern Europe. You know, so cost, labour, and, and a really broken relationship between the primary producer and the supermarkets. Okay. One last one, I think this last one here is, uh, somebody had growing potatoes last year and wireworms infested them. What can they do to re organically remove them? I've um, maybe Parks come across this one. I'd say rotations is probably one of the main ones. Um, but just interestingly, I saw a, a grower um, who had wireworm in brassicas, which which I'd never seen before. Um, wireworm in, in a crop of broccoli. Um, eating the roots and, and stunting the plant, obviously not really causing too much damage to the to the flower above the ground. But um, they had uh, chickens. They they put chickens in after after the rotation. Now I don't know any more about it than that. So, but but they seem to think it was working. So, could be could be some maybe more research needed there. Um, but I don't. Have you ever come across that park? No, no, I don't. Someone's James, my cousin. I know my cousin James Lottie, so I, I can see the names of people posting the questions here. But no, I, I, I don't. Um, yeah, they used to put the, the chickens in after uh, just follow, following the plow or following the, the, the tiller. Um, and and it, it, seemed, it seemed they know it was serious um, control from that. But I'd say rotation is probably the, the main control there. Okay. Um, um... Gillian, will you take the last one there? Yeah, do you feel it? Um, there's enough financial support from government bodies? Maybe a brief comment on that there, because we're, I'm just conscious on time here. And we've... Well, okay, the brief comment is that you're 50% of the EU average across the rest of the EU. So no, I don't think there's enough support. So I appreciate there's a budget. I know they're going to give a lot more for organics. I personally um, don't think that the, it, it is enough, but I also am aware that it's under a budget. But um, I think it could it could be improved, and I think one of the key things there are the agri environment schemes as well. We want to make sure that there's not an issue with double funding, um, and certainly the um, our organisation has, as I say, been on that panel for the last two years. We've put a, a huge amount of work into every SWOT analysis, needs assessment, and all of that, and we've been through all of this. And we really would like to see a bit more support in that side. And then when we do get that support, because it's not all about the money, it means that the rest of it, once the government, um, and they have been very generous this year, 500% increase in the budget, it's great. Um, but once you start to get those supports in place, the infrastructure comes with it as well. So be that marketing or research or whatever, because it's very easy to say not enough's being done, but it has been a very, very small minority of people in, in, in Ireland and in organics till, um, till more recently. So and it's going to grow. And it's going to grow because it's the way of the future. Um, of course, they have to up it if they're going to do it. I think so, certainly. Um, you know, if people get a good price per product, an awful lot of the time the, the funding isn't there. But unfortunately, we are in the world of commodities and that's how it works. So, yes, they do require more funding. And finally, this is our final question, uh, Porik. Uh, do you, would you like to comment? The question is, how many people does Porik employ? And at what size scale is it, advi is it mm -hmm. advisable to employ? to employ people? Um, we took on our first person through the seasonal horticulture program when we were at about four to five acres. And so I think you can manage up to two to three acres on your own or family, you tend to, so you should be able to include that. At the moment we've, we've about 20 full-time and maybe five part-time staff and, you know, managing six to acre farm and then working with 10 other growers around the country. And um, yeah, so that's the scale we're at, and it's advisable to employ help. Yeah, no, it is. If, um, it depends your system and what you want out of it. You know, if you just want to do all the work, it depends what you're like managing people. Um, you know, but if, if you might be good with the market, so you might need to get someone in who give you support, and then you're out doing the sales. Uh, 
but I always say to all farms or anyone start, starting up, give yourselves five years. You do need an, another income to as a buffer, not because you can't take a lot out over the first few years. And um, myself, I was teaching part time for four years while we started the farm, and then I was able to move away from from education, full time farming. So have that income there over the first few years. Um, or, or if it's a farm or your wife, partner, someone else has it, that's just very important. Okay. Thank you very much, Corey. And thank you to all three of you. I We threw a lot of questions at you. So thank you very much. Joe, maybe I'll hand it over to you to wrap things up. Thank you very much, Elaine. Yeah, no, very comprehensive uh, question and answer uh, session there and very well answered and great participation too from the people that uh, that tuned in tonight. So thanks to everyone that did uh, join us tonight. So no, uh, that brings our webinar tonight to a close. A uh, huge thanks to our three speakers tonight who I think covered uh, what, what is could be a very detailed uh, topic and we could really get lost in detail, but I think you gave a great overview of... Um, of organic horticulture enterprises and getting it going um, in, in the space we had, uh, the time we had allocated to it. So absolutely huge thanks to everyone and a huge thanks, especially to Owen, Podrick and Gillian for uh, three fantastic presentations. Uh, we'll have the link for anyone that uh, wants to listen back to it up, as I say, hopefully for the end of the week. And we'll try maybe get one or two on, on your presentation. Your particular had a lot of links there as to where people could go for further information. So we might try to get that one in particular up there so that if anyone wants to know where to go next for information, um, uh, Owen's last four or five slides there, I think had huge, uh, 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 great information. Uh, Gillian's one as well is the, the, the Irish Organic Association Forward Stroke EIP to look at the MOPS report for anyone who wants to see it. So again, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks again to our three speakers and we'll see you again, hopefully the last Wednesday of February for our next webinar. Talk to you then. Bye bye. Thank everyone. you. Bye Thanks, bye. Joe. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you all. Take care, Jill. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Thanks, Patrick. Bye bye. It's very good. Thanks.